In this episode, we'll look at the possibility that life can evolve on one world and then be transported to another. If true, that would complicate the history of life, but most realistically, it would mean a huge danger of contamination from Earth to other worlds. We know from Earth that rocks can contain living microbes, also that many microbes can survive the space environment by going dormant. What if a bit of rock carrying such microbes were dislodged and survived the journey to another world? We know rocks routinely travel among the inner planets. If the rock contained life, would that life escape into the new world? This is not just a theoretical possibility. For example, earlier, in episode 4, we learned of the meteorite ALH8401. This 1.9 kilogram rock formed on Mars about 4 billion years ago, during a time that Mars may have been evolving life. The rock is famous for its fossil structures that look a bit like cells. The current interpretation is that this rock probably wasn't carrying life, Nevertheless, it's very plausible that life could exist underground on Mars today. Maybe other rocks carrying life previously made it to Earth or will in future. What concerns us is the journey ALH84001 made because this was common and typical. About 17 million years ago, an asteroid hit Mars. Even though the bulk of such collisions happened when the solar system was young, they still occur occasionally. The impact blasted a chunk of the Martian crust into space. Mars has relatively weak gravity, so it's easy for bits of rock to escape. ALH84001 drifted following a complex, roughly spiral path towards the Sun. About 13,000 years ago, it finally crossed the Earth's orbit. Earth's relatively strong gravity pulled it in and it hit Earth. More than a hundred other Martian meteorites have also been recovered from Earth's surface. That's only a fraction of the total annual exchange of about half a ton, albeit mostly in the form of dust. All the rocky planets exchange material to some degree. Could a rock microbe survive being blasted into space? Could it also survive the dryness, radiation, and variable temperatures of space. For example, the sunlit side of a space rock between Earth and Mars might be 120 degrees, while the shaded side could be more than minus 100 degrees at the same time. Could the microbe take all that for millions of years and survive the journey? We don't know. Maybe. We've successfully revived microorganisms from the Siberian permafrost that had been frozen for 3 million years. Other bacteria were awakened after 255 million years trapped inside a layer of very dry rock salt. While microorganisms could not cope with the space radiation directly, the rock itself could shield against that. A large enough chunk, 10 meters in diameter should do, could shelter bacteria inside it from most of the space radiation. 10 meter rock would probably also protect microbes from the heat of entry into a planetary atmosphere. A typical space rock might have been traveling at 60,000 kilometers per hour just before it hit Earth or any planet. At that speed, friction from the atmosphere makes it white hot. That's why meteorites are visible as streaks across the sky. But here's the key problem. A rock large enough to shield any inhabitants from space radiation and from the heat of atmospheric entry, that is, 10 or more meters across, traveling at 60,000 kilometers per hour, would cause a tremendous explosion more powerful than an atomic bomb. The rock and everything in it would be vaporized. It seems extremely unlikely that anything could survive. However, we still don't know, and life keeps surprising us. Assuming life exists on other worlds of our solar system, did it all evolve in one place and then spread? This idea is called panspermia. Some astrobiologists find the theory very attractive. Although panspermia is just about plausible in every way, except for the impact problem, 
We can't discount that because it's a serious problem for the theory. The real trouble with panspermia isn't its scientific plausibility, but rather why some people need it to be true. Panspermia is a viewpoint which denies the fact of life's arising as a chemical process. Admitting that something has a physical basis doesn't take anything away from it. Actually, that only makes it more amazing. A lot of amazing things are chemical processes such as the human mind. Any chemical process will always proceed the same way whenever conditions are the same. Understanding life as chemical process means that it must independently pop up everywhere conditions allow. And we have seen in this series that conditions are favourable in many places. Therefore, life would have evolved separately many times. Panspermists disagree and think that life had one origin, or at least the fewer the better. They just don't like the idea that life could have evolved on Earth or anywhere by itself. Panspermia doesn't deepen our understanding or contribute much. Actually, it's bad science. In scientific reasoning, the simplest answer is usually the right one. Whereas, panspermia adds unnecessary complexity. The simplest explanation is that life evolves independently over and over again. That's another reason to explore, and Titan specifically. If life exists there, it would certainly be utterly alien and would have originated independently of life on Earth. That would pull the plug on panspermia as another in a series of old, wrong ideas. The exploration is part of the testing and confirmation that makes science what it is. Despite its implausibility, panspermia could still become a very real issue. In exploring the planets and moons, we risk introducing microbes from Earth. While we don't know whether any indigenous life forms exist beyond Earth, it's already clear that our microbes could survive on most worlds we've learned about. Our microbes might outcompete the native life forms if there are any, or worse, suppress their evolution if they have not yet evolved. We have to be more responsible than that and take great care not to infect the other worlds of our solar system. Space agencies do routinely sterilise their spacecraft for this reason, but we have to remain vigilant and serious about it. This raises a sizeable ethical objection to human exploration of the surfaces of other worlds. We can sterilise robotic spacecraft, but not anything carrying people. We are totally inseparable from our bacteria, so wherever we go, they do too. If you'd like to learn more about this subject, click on the next video. That is about life out in the cosmos and our chances of finding it. Thanks for watching.